good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Pooja Bakshi, who will be talk who will be talking today on infectious and glandular lesions on cytology. Dr. Pooja Bakshi is a senior consultant and professor, Department of Cytopathology, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, doc, she is an MD pathology from AFMC Pune and trained at PJM Chandigarh and Southampton, UK, with over 20 years of experience in pathology with special expertise in cytopathology. She's played a key role in establishment of endoscopic ultrasound and bronchoscopic ultrasound FNA and liquid-based cytology in Sir Gangaram Hospital. She's been a guide and co-guide to many DNB students and has been invited as an eminent speaker at various CMEs and conferences. And she has many publications in national and international journals. Over to you, Dr. Pooja. Thank you, Dr. Anila, for this kind introduction. And I thank Aho for inviting me today to take this talk, which is uh, very close to my heart. We know that uh, cervical cytology has been the backbone of cervical cancer screening for many years. And although the focus is on detection of the squamous intraepithelial lesions, uh, it also includes detection of various infectious organisms and glandular abnormalities. And that is what I will be dealing with in my talk today. We know that the Bethesda system is uh, accepted worldwide for reporting of cervical cytology. And after giving a report on the specimen adequacy, we give our result as either negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, that is NILM, which includes the reactive changes and organisms and the epithelial cell abnormalities, which can be squamous or glandular. So let's first deal with the organisms and infections that we can diagnose on cervical or pap smear. The most common organisms are Trichomonas vaginalis, Candida, Bacterial vaginosis, Actinomyces, Lactobacilli is the normal flora, changes due to herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, human papilloma virus, HPV I'll not be covering in my talk, Chlamydia trachomatis, and rarely the eggs and trophozoites of various parasites. Vaginal infections are common and are a health issue in developing countries more so because of the low socioeconomic conditions and the poor personal hygiene. Although more than 50% are asymptomatic, they are associated with obstetric and gynae complications. So pap smear can address two issues. One, of course, detection of the epithelial abnormalities. And secondly, treatment of infection, which can be timely. So let's go to the most common organism, Trichomonas vaginalis. It is a sexually transmitted infection. Many women and men are asymptomatic and the women may present with the classic foul smelling uh, greenish yellow vaginal discharge. There may be itching and painful urination. Strawberry cervix may be seen on examination. It's a protozoan. And in the initial months, many of our residents pick up a lot of cytoplasmic fragments and call them as Trichomonas. So uh, we can confuse if you're not careful, you must look for the nucleus and the cytoplasmic eosinophilic granules before you label uh, it as trichomonas. So it is a pear shaped oval, round, kite shaped cyanophilic organism. It is 15 to 30 micron in size. The nucleus is pale, vesicular and eccentric and the uh, cytoplasm shows these eosinophilic cytoplasmic granules. Ragella may or may not be seen. There are certain associated changes which can give a clue to presence of trichomonas, that is, uh, presence of inflammation, perinuclear halos in the squamous epithelial cells, polyballs that are clusters of neutrophils sticking to the epithelial cells, and you may see leptothrix, these are long filamentous bacteria, and they are associated with presence of trichomonas. The next common organism is candida. The woman may present with thick, curdy, white discharge, which is odorless, and there may be itching and redness. Classically, there is this appearance of sheesh kebab effect on the pap smear. As you can see here, there is pairing of these epithelial cells. What you see are these budding yeast forms and pseudo hyphae, as you can see in this. 
The uh, yeast forms, they extend to form these pseudo hyphae. Most common is Candida albicans. Candida glabrata shows only the yeast forms and they are more commonly seen in the immunocompromised. So these are very easily seen on the pap smear, especially in the liquid based cytology, and it is not difficult to pick up these. Next, we come to shift in flora, suggestive of bacterial vaginosis. We know lactobacilli is the dominant flora of the vagina. But when there is a shift to a mixed vaginal flora, which includes uh, gardenella, bacteroids, mycoplasma, then we suggest a shift in flora. Women mostly in the reproductive years get this. And there may be no symptoms or the patient may have a watery vaginal discharge, which is fishy in odor. How do you recognize this? It is the presence of these clue cells, which are nothing but cocobacilli covering the individual squamous cells and obscuring their cellular borders. They also form a filmy background. Classically, there is absence of lactobacilli in the pap smear and absence of a significant neutrophil response. So you see only these cocobacilli. But you must correlate with the clinical and microbiological findings to ascertain if there is a clinical infection. The next organism we see is actinomyces, and uh, very often the residents get very excited when they see these cotton wooly clumps and cotton ball-like structures. But uh, I just want to point out that many lactobacilli sometimes they clump together to form these cotton ball-like structures and may be confused with actinomyces. So look for the isolated bacilli in the background. If you see isolated bacilli, it is unlikely to be actinomyces. Actinomyces forms these tangled clumps of filamentous organisms arranged in a radial distribution, which are thinner than pseudohyphae of candida and are long filamentous. They're associated with an acute inflammatory response and also usually there is a history of an IUD. Changes consistent with herpes simplex virus infection, very interesting to see on the pap smear. Remember the three M's, that is multinucleation, as you can see here, molding of the nuclei to each other, and margination of chromatin. That is, there is ground glassing of the nucleus where the uh, nucleus has accumulated the intranuclear viral particles, giving a ground glass effect to the nucleus. In the early stages of herpes simplex, you may see these eosinophilic intranuclear inclusions, as you can see on the right side. And these are surrounded by a halo. And these are seen in the early stages of infection. Tanlomatous cervicitis, not very common, but we have to always include the possibility of tuberculosis when we see this. Also, they can be seen with post-radiotherapy, post-surgery, presence of a foreign body or an IUD, and other infections like chlamydia, granuloma, and inguinal, and syphilis. This was a pap smear where we saw these single isolated organisms, which had this nucleus, aerosome, and ingested RBCs, as you can see in the right side photograph. So what do you think is this? Yeah, these are amoebic trophozoites, which are not very commonly seen, but we do see sometimes in pap smear and they come from the perennial contamination. So that covers my gamut of the infectious lesions and organisms that you may see on pap smear. If you are careful and you scrutinize enough, you will pick up these organisms, which uh, can lead to timely treatment. Going on to the next uh, half of this lecture, that is the glandular abnormalities on cervical cytology. The Bethesda 2014 reporting says that these glandular epithelial abnormalities should be divided into atypical glandular cells and specify if you can into endocervical, endometrial, or just leave it at glandular. Further specify if it is NOS or favor neoplastic. The next category is endocervical adenocarcinoma in C2. Not a very common diagnosis and not very easy to make on pap smear. And of course, the adenocarcinomas, which include endocervical, endometrial, extra uterine, or the NOS. So when we say NOS, it means we are not very sure that the atypia that we are seeing is due to a florid reactive or reparative change, or is it a neoplastic lesion? But when we say agus, atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic, then we are kind of um, suggesting 
that there is possibility of an in situ or an adenocarcinoma there, and the patient will definitely need further management. There are challenges to diagnosis of atypical glandular cells, more so than squamous lesions. The sensitivity for glandular lesion detection is low on pap smear for many reasons. One, there is infrequent exfoliation of these tumor cells and lesser number of tumor cells are shed into the pap smear as compared to the squamous lesions. So it may be difficult to pick these cells up. Specificity is moderate. The number of the uh, atypical glandular cell reporting on pap smears is much less, less than 1%. And there are many pitfalls and lookalikes which can lead to a false positive diagnosis. So you have to be very careful when you give a diagnosis of atypical glandular cells. Liquid-based cytology has improved detection of glandular abnormalities. And that is our experience as well, probably because of the better sampling of that brush that we use, the less obscuration by mucus, blood and inflammatory cells better preservation and visualization of even the few abnormal cells that are present on the pap smear. Although the percentage of uh, this report is less on the total overall pap reports, this clinical significance is very high because this diagnosis is very often associated with the risk of a pre-neoplastic or neoplastic lesion, almost 10 to 39% in various studies. So it is very important to correctly identify atypical glandular cells on pap smears. Association with high-risk HPV is there, though it is much less as compared to the squamous lesions, and HPV-18 is very more strongly associated. Of course, management, Dr. Mala has already shown, you have to go ahead with colposcopy and endocervical and endometrial sampling. So what are the normal glandular cells we see in the pap smear? We see these endocervical cells in this classic honeycomb arrangement. And from the side view, we see this picket fence arrangement. There is polarization of nuclei. They are well separated out. There is no overlapping and the chromatin is fine. Whereas when we see reactive or reparative changes in the endocervical cells, which is a very common phenomena, either due to inflammation or due to presence of an endocervical polyp, we will see these <clears throat> changes, that is nuclear enlargement, presence of these prominent nuclei. However, you can appreciate that the nuclei is still well separated out. There is no significant overlapping. There is still moderate to abundant cytoplasm. And you may see polymorphs within these groups of endocervical cells. Whereas when we see atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic, what do we see? We see these strips of pseudostratified epithelium, which is obviously columnar in shape with these oblong cigar-shaped nuclei. There is significant nuclear overlapping, enlargement, pseudostratification, and loss of polarity. So it is very important to appreciate these features. There is hyperchromasia, coarse chromatin. The NC ratio is higher, and there may be feathering seen at the edges. When we go to the next level, that is adenocarcinoma in C2, in addition to these strips of pseudostratified epithelium, we also see these rosettes or gland-like arrangement, feathering, as you can see on the right side, and bird tail-like arrangement, which are clues to the diagnosis of a, an adenocarcinoma in C2. This was a case of a frank endocervical adenocarcinoma. And what can we see here? These pseudo fat stratified strips of columnar epithelium, which are obviously looking uh, atypical, their nuclei are enlarged, they are pseudo stratified, not arranged at the same level, there is overlapping. So it is obviously looking malignant. And an important finding can be the presence of these single cells in the background. They are elongated nuclei, which are seem to be kind of bulging out of the cytoplasm, what is called as an egg and snake appearance. And the presence of these single cells can be a clue to the diagnosis of an endocervical adenocarcinoma. So look for these single isolated cells, which are atypical with columnar elongated nuclei. There are many cytological mimickers of atypical glandular cells. Always remember repair and reactive changes, which I have already shown you. IUD changes, presence of polyps, tubal metaplasia, Vaginal tubal prolapse, endometrial hypoplasia. So the list is long. 
and you should be very careful before you give this diagnosis. One thing I wanted to highlight was the presence of these bubble gum cells, which can be confused with a atypical glandular cell or even a high-grade cell. These are all due to IUD-associated reactive changes. And you see these very large cells with vacuolated cytoplasm, a large nuclei and nucleoli. So when there is presence and history of an IUD, raise your bar for diagnosing an atypical glandular cell. Tubal metaplasia can also be a pitfall that you can diagnose it. If you see carefully, you will be able to see the presence of the cilia and terminal bars. So after the endocervical, going on to the endometrial cells, how and when do we report the endometrial cells? So as per the latest Bethesda, in a woman who is more than 45 years of age, a presence of endometrial cells has to be reported, even if they are benign. We know that endometrial cells are shed normally also during menses and in the proliferative phase of the cycle, that is day one to day 12. So if you see within this first phase, you can put in a note that they are in phase with the menstrual history provided, with the LMP date provided. If these are beyond the uh, first 12 days, then you have to say they are out of phase with the menstrual history provided. Of course, endometrial cells have to be reported in postmenopausal women and atypical endometrial cells have to be reported regardless of the age. And what we see are these tight ball-like clusters where the nuclei are small, there is scant cytoplasm, nucleoli are not seen. So these are the normal endometrial cells which are shared into the pap smear. But how do the atypical cells look like? If you see the uh, these fragments are slightly larger, though they are still 3D clusters or papillary fragments. The nuclei are enlarged. There is prominent nucleoli, a lot of vacuolated cytoplasm. And there are this bag of polycells, that is, you see lots of polymorphs within this group of tumor cells. And of course, there is obvious hyperchromasia, pleomorphism, vacuolated cytoplasm, and you may even see a watery diathesis in the background. So if you compare, on the left side is the benign, and on the right side are the atypical endometrial cells. So you have to carefully see this group of glandular cells to ascertain if there is ATP or not. Not only the uterine, sometimes the ovarian and fallopian tube tumors can also shed cells into the pap smear. Basically, the background will be clean. There will be no diathesis. And you may see these papillary configuration or 3D clusters of tumor cells. And even samoma bodies may be seen sometimes, as you can see on the right picture. Rarely, there can be direct extension from the colon and urinary bladder, so keep that in mind. Lastly, a word about malignant mixed mullerian tumors. These are rare, highly aggressive carcinosarcomas. And since they can form these fungating polypoidal masses extending to the cervical os, they may shed cells in the pap smear. And you can see the typical biphasic appearance if you are lucky the malignant epithelial and the malignant mesenchymal cell. So the take-home message from my today's lecture is that infections and organisms can be picked up in the pap smear even if the patient is asymptomatic and can help in timely treatment. And glandular abnormalities, though they form a much less number of the pap smear reports, have a significant clinical value because their detection can lead to further management and early diagnosis of the candular abnormalities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pooja Bakshi, for your informative talk. Especially, it's really informative for our budding pathologists.